Hello everyone. Today's gospel is an uninterrupted continuation of last week's gospel. It begins with saying, Jesus departed from there and came to his native place accompanied by his disciples. The word there in the verse refers to Capernaum. According to all four of the gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Capernaum was the home of five disciples, John, James, Simon, Andrew and Matthew, and the temporary home of Jesus during his public ministry. It overlooks the Sea of Galilee, near to the place where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus taught and performed many healing miracles at Capernaum. In last week's Gospel, we read two such accounts the healing of the unnamed woman suffering from hemorrhage and the raising to life of a young girl who, we learned, was feared dead. The girl was the daughter of Jairus, a leader in the synagogue at Capernaum. In addition to these two miracles, and as mentioned in the earlier chapters, Mark also reports of Jesus driving out an evil spirit from a possessed man in Capernaum the curing of Simon's mother-in-law who was ill with a high fever, the healing of a man with leprosy and of a paralytic, the casting out of the demons from the demoniac among the tombs, etc. Friends, in today's Gospel, we read that Jesus went from there to his native place Nazareth, which is about 30 kilometers away. During his stay in Nazareth, and on the Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue. A synagogue was an important place for the Jews in the time of Jesus. It was a place where Jews gathered for worship and for study of the scriptures. Any synagogue service includes 1. The recitation of the Shema, in Hebrew meaning to hear or to listen, a liturgical prayer taken from three scriptural passages and which expresses the Jewish people's faith in and love of God. Two the reading of a portion of the Torah or law, that is, first five books of the Bible. 3. The reading of excerpts from the writings of the prophets. And 4. A sermon explaining the scripture. Friends, the custom was that an elder of the congregation or a rabbi would be invited to read a scriptural text and interpret it for others. This was the case with Jesus' synagogue appearance in Nazareth. Jesus was already being called a rabbi by his disciples. But when Jesus spoke, many people were astonished. However, Mark does not mention what Jesus spoke about. He only records that the people asked, Where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hand? Friends, no doubt some of you might wonder, what Jesus said or did that astonished the listeners. Friends, in the parallel account in Luke chapter 4 verses 14 to 29, we read what Jesus had taught on that day. As Jesus attended the service, he was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Having unrolled the scroll, he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor to proclaim liberty to captives and a new sight to the blind, to free the oppressed and to announce the Lord's year of mercy. Friends, Jesus then gave the scroll back to the attendant and said, Today these prophetic words come true as you listen. This was a startling statement for Jesus to make. It is as if Jesus was saying, I am the person he has spoken of and at this present time, the Spirit of God is upon me and has anointed me to preach glad tidings to you and all the good things mentioned in the scripture. Friends, according to Luke's account, the people were astonished by how well Jesus spoke. They praised Jesus' words of wisdom and the mighty works of miracles that were coming through him. Now, what miracles were they amazed about? In fact, no miracles took place on this particular day in Nazareth. They had probably heard of the miracles that occurred in Capernaum and around the Sea of Galilee. However, 
they were furious at Jesus' claim to be the Messiah about whom Isaiah had prophesied. Besides, when Jesus preached, he did so as one who had authority, not as the scribes or teachers of the law. In other words, the people of Nazareth may have acknowledged that the words quoted from the prophet Isaiah were spoken of the Messiah, but they would not believe that Jesus had any credential to prove that he was the Messiah. And they found Jesus' claim scandalous because Jesus was not distinguished in riches, learning, rank or power. They were expecting the Messiah to come with pomp and ceremony as would a great king and deliver Israel from the Roman slavery. Friends, Jesus came to Nazareth proclaiming a message of salvation and showing acts of mercy, but the people altogether wrangled on points so trivial and unessential. They referred to Jesus as the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. Remember, the people in his hometown were his family, friends and neighbors. Friends, too much familiarity breeds contempt, as the saying goes. Perhaps the people of Nazareth were just too familiar with Jesus and they took offense at Jesus' humble birth. They made the indigent circumstances of Jesus' family the reason why they would not receive him as a prophet and the Messiah, although they were amazed at his wisdom and at his miracles. They were too proud to be taught by one of their own whom they took to be their equal or an inferior. They saw Jesus only as the carpenter, not the Messiah. They could not accept that someone who was born of a modest household was worthy to be so highly educated in the scriptures. Friends, Jesus, knowing their hearts, were not open to the testimony of the scriptures, said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. Friends, he was not upset that his own town rejected him because this was the first of what would be the many rejection during his earthly ministry. As a matter of fact, Mark writes in chapter 3 verse 21 that when Jesus began his ministry and his relatives heard about it, they accused him of having gone mad. Acting on that belief, they tried to take charge of him as if he did not know what he was doing. Friends, when Jesus said, that the only place people do not honor a prophet is in his hometown, he obviously pointed to their prolonged experience of unbelief and indifference to God, to his message and to his servants, the prophets, as sent by God to call Israel to repentance and renewal of their covenant with God. Friends, as a result of their rejection, Jesus was not able to perform any mighty workles, miracles among them except to heal a few sick people by placing his hands on them. Jesus was not able to work any mighty miracles, does not mean a restriction on his power. It was just that their unbelief kept Jesus from doing all that he could. At the Gospel's closing, Mark writes that Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. Friends, the Gospels tell us that the people were constantly astonished and amazed at Jesus' teaching and works. However, there are only two recorded instances of Jesus being amazed. One case was in Capernaum. According to the Gospel accounts of Luke and Matthew, a Roman centurion came to Jesus and implored him on behalf of one of his servants who was ill. When Jesus offered to go to the centurion's house to perform the healing, the centurion told Jesus that he felt unworthy to receive him under his roof or come into his home, and that if he just spoke the word of healing, his servant would get well. On hearing these words, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Friends, today we are using the words of the centurion when we prepare to receive the body and blood of Christ in Holy Mass. The other occasion was in his hometown Nazareth, as we read today. Jesus was filled with wonder 
at the total lack of faith in him among his fellow Jews, who had been waiting for the Messiah. The non-Jew centurion's faith stood in contrast to the lack of faith of the Jews. Friends, what is the message for us? Jesus is not physically present with us today. Nonetheless, his representatives such as our Pope, bishops, priests, ministers, monks, nuns and lay preachers are here. Through them, Christ continues to spread his message of salvation. They are the modern day prophets and messengers of God. But we often reject God and his word and his purposes for ourselves by rejecting his prophet messengers. In spite of the message of truth, love, compassion and justice that they bring, we have a tremendous tendency to reject the message as coming from God and thus having authority because of the imperfect character, weaknesses and flaws of such messengers. We also use various other excuses such as language, place, skin color, social status, intelligence, mannerism, etc. to dismiss these divine messengers. Friends, there have been instances where people have been sent to their own native places as prophets sent by God but are rejected by their own people. By one means or another, the swiftest method of rejection of the prophets has been to find a pretext, however false or absurd, that dismisses the person so that his or her message could also be dismissed. Friends, the trouble with rejection because of familiar personal familiarity with the prophets is that the prophets are always somebody's son or daughter or somebody's neighbor. They are chosen from among us, not transported from another planet. Friends, there are times some of us behave like the people of Nazareth and place ourselves between the messengers and the message, doing our utmost to make the message of God ineffective. Our character and prospects are similar to those of the Jews who could not experience great miracles because of unbelief. Self-sufficiency, self-importance, arrogance, apathy, pride, prejudice, indifference, etc. separate us from God and therefore he hides his frame face from us. He has limited his work in us. Our hearts are sometimes as hard and impenetrable as those present in the time of Christ because we are ignorant of that which we condemn and oppose. Friends, the Lord Jesus says, Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. He also says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my call and open the door, I will come into you and have supper with you and you with me. Friends, if you refuse to hear the voice of God and refuse to open the door, then our Lord Jesus Christ will move on, and we will be left destitute of his presence and of true riches. Let us assume the counsel given here applies to us today. Let us seek the counsel of God and hearken to those we acknowledge as prophets with a humble and prayerful spirit, so that the Lord may enlighten our understanding and enable us to carefully weigh every point of truth that is present in his scripture and truly believe in him. Amen. God bless you.